Welcome back to part two of the Soul Relationship audio series. I am Jean Denny from the School of Unusual Life Learning, where we learn about how life moves and people change. Everybody struggles with their relationships, no? And in the first audio blog, I just put forward a few basic ideas about relationship, kind of like building a foundation on which we could add more ideas, which we'll do today. Just to review, the first one was that relationships are really important. That they're deeply connected to our bodies and psyches, and we need them to thrive and survive. I suggested a kind of radical idea that relationships are actually conduits of energy that speak the language of energy and rhythm. They kind of have an anatomy and a physiology. And these energy structures have to be built and have a life of their own. They change predictably over time. And we'll be talking about all of that more in uh, future uh, audio blogs. I was going to talk today about what I call the breathing relationship or the life pulse of a relationship, if you will. But I realized I, I needed to say a few more things that were kind of basic first. So I'm gonna save that conversation and make another foundational statement. And that is that there are lots of kinds of relationships that we have and a lot of differences in them. And it would be just useful to get some of those differences forward. Amazingly, when I start to teach about relationships, almost everyone in our culture, our American culture at least, thinks that this is a talk about a particular kind of love relationship, mainly a partner or a romantic and sexual love. That's amazing to me. And I'm, I have a lot to say about that. And we'll start that conversation today. But let's notice one obvious thing, that we are actually in relationship with many living things in our lives. And we are mainly completely unconscious of most of those things. A lot of things other than people or even our pets, like the tree outside your window or the animals that might live in your yard. Maybe even other people at a distance. Some people say, and I would agree, that our most primary relationship is with God or the cosmos or spirit. I'd like to add nature to that idea which is nothing but a web of living things constantly talking with each other. And we are very essentially a part of that web, even when we're not aware of it. In fact, I would say that, that our connection with that web is our essential relationship. If you want proof, go lay on the earth on a summer night or go to a meadow in the day and listen to the throb of cicadas, grasshoppers, or birds. Put your feet on the earth or let put your back on the earth and you can feel how you are connected to both nature and to spirit. So that's my first point. Everyone has this most essential relationship. You are part of the throbbing creation of life by just the fact of your beating heart and your breathing lungs and the fact that we touch earth when we walk. And that is good to know on very bad days when we may be feeling very alone. But of course, we have human connections that take most of our awareness, many of them, and they are different. Each person has a different role in our lives and we exchange energy with each one differently based on who they are and these roles that we have with each other. And I want to just make a note, most of these relationships are not sexual or romantic in nature. Make a note of that. I am not demeaning sexuality here or its importance, only saying that that's not the primary driver of many of our relationships. Let's take a moment now to reflect on whether the close relationships of your young life, let's say the ones you formed up to age about 25, are different than the close relationships 
of your adult life after 25. I call early relationships, such as with parents, siblings, best friends, peers, early peers, and young love, our first love, I call them primary relationships. Why? Because they help us actually build our relationship system as we're growing up and our whole neurobiological relationship system. We could think of these people as our tribe or our village, and these relationships live as a part of us for as long as we live, whether we stay in touch with them or not. Just a quick story of my own experience of going back to my hometown after 20 years for a high school reunion and realizing how deeply cellularly connected I was to the classmates I grew up was astounding. They are part of the architecture of our psyche and our identity. And we use them for the rest of our lives. These are, you know, the ones that your therapist wants you to talk about. And I'm actually not going to talk much about these in this series because they're just a little bit more difficult to talk about. But if you want to learn more about primary relationships, just come to the school where we do that. In this series, we're going to focus on the people we meet after we have grown up. And I call those secondary relationships. Those are your adult life friends, partners, colleagues, bosses, neighbors. We could call these folks your adult community. They're just a little easier to teach about. So the point I'm making, the second point, is that there are big differences between our early life relationships and our later ones. And because the later relationships build off of our early ones, they can actually open us up to our youngest, earliest wounds and longings no matter how perfectly we may have been parented or how great our childhood was. Hope for healing our earliest wounds is part of every relationship we form throughout our lives, whether we're aware of this or not. And it's good to recognize that within each encounter, good or bad, with all of the people we meet throughout our lives, healing or rewounding is a possibility. Now that brings us to a third idea, and that's that these later life or secondary relationships bring us opportunities to do healing on things that uh, might have completed very young in our lives, very early in our lives. And if we keep that in mind, that everyone we meet is trying to heal their childhood wounds, whether they're aware of it or not, or trying to avoid feeling them, it helps us realize that a lot of other people's behavior with us doesn't have that much to do with us. Good to keep in mind. We're all trying to heal. And sometimes we can actually help each other heal. Your boss is trying to heal. Your neighbor's trying to heal. Your car repair person and your partner is trying to heal. But dang, you know, the very fact that each of us has this potential to open us up and do some healing with each other also opens us up to vulner vulnerability with each other. And like, you know, who really wants too much of that? So that brings me to another point. Actually, having roles and a context to meet people in helps us develop relationships. Imagine for a minute the discomfort you might feel if you were put in a room with a random stranger for three hours with absolutely no context. You were just dropped in a room with another person. No thing to do, no matrix of other relationships. It might be really stressful. You'd talk if you spoke the same language, and maybe you'd try to construct some kind of context. Maybe being in that situation would be the one that you were sharing, the discomfort of being there together. It actually sounds like a lot of online dating dates I've heard about. But if you were to take that same person and meet them through friends, or in the context of work where the roles and tasks were assigned, you'd have a very different experience of them. Probably a little more intimate one, ironically. Because we often think, that 
it takes showing vulnerability to form relationships. But this is kind of the parallel idea to it, that we actually need some structure. When we're given roles and a context for our relationships to begin to form in, it helps us form them without quite so much defense and kind of removes some anxiety and maybe allows us the space to watch each other exploring who we are and who they are and whether we might be interested in knowing more about them. So point number four, defining roles and sharing context are important to a good relationship. So before we end today, I'd like to add one more observation. In modern American culture, at least, lots of parts of this web of connection we've been talking about, the one that makes us feel organismically as if we're related to everything, is missing or damaged. Maybe we never developed a relationship to the God cosmos spirit or nature. Of course, it's not too late. But maybe we no longer have family or early tribe in our life, or maybe we never did. Maybe we don't have much of a later life community to relate to or a role in it, which is very important for our sense of coming of age. And these facts are not your fault if you're feeling these, nor can you help longing for more relationships. As a therapist, what I notice is that in the absence of these things that would maybe ordinarily be feeding us with connection, energy, information of our part in the world, we put an intolerable amount of expectation on one kind of relationship. And that is the romantic love relationship or partner. We expect that kind of love to fill so many deficits in our lives. It overburdens it. Our relationship needs can be so great, it can actually make it hard for a healthy partnership to form, which is kind of tragic. And therein is a problem we need to name. We need a lot of different relationships to be healthy. And those relationships, they need each other not just one kind, many kinds. So gosh, that's a lot to have tried to say in under 13 minutes. This is the kind of thing that we talk about and study in Seoul. And if you want to find out more about that, uh, you can visit my website at jeandenny.com, J-E-A-N-N-E-D-E-N-N-E-Y.com and click on the school. Also, Another reminder that this Saturday, April 10th, I'll be doing a short exploration on working with grief, uh, 11 Eastern. There's room, sign up and come. You can find it under the events page on my website. We ask for a $10 donation to the work, which you can make at GoFundMe. Um, and we, of course, really appreciate donations for our scholarship fund if you have been inspired by this talk today. Stay tuned for the next audio when I will talk about the art of developing healthy relationships and a lot of other things. Dear friends, if you've listened, thank you. Share the love, kindly give credit for ideas where it's due, and I look forward to relating with you again soon.